So yesterday we, we had a definition, but if you had vectors living in some Rn, say 29 dimensions, or if you want to do string theory, I suppose you'd be in 26 dimensions. Uh, we define the span of those vectors to be the set given by what? All of your combinations. So remember we had a picture that you could take. Of course I can't draw can't draw 32 vectors in 29 dimensional space very well. So strategically, I'll draw this as a, what you think is a two dimensional plane, but that's only because your eyesight is failing. <laughs> so what do you do? You take scalars times the various vectors, positive or negative numbers, and you consider the sum of such things. That's what linear combinations are. And what do we want, what did we say is true about this collection of vectors? It's a subspace of R. Forms a subspace. Okay? So that's what I want to prove a picture today. Scalars. Span. One to DK. So by the way, this is short for proposition. You get to learn all sorts of arcane words that philosophers like, right? Like lemma and theorem and proposition. There's a hierarchy of things that are true in mathematics. Generally, the hierarchy is that a lemma is something that's eh, not so interesting in of itself, but it gets used to do something that's interesting. A proposition is a middle-of-the-road theorem, but not, nothing that anybody wants to say is one of the most important things you're ever going to learn. And then theorems are things that are more noteworthy, that are true statements that we're going to prove. So a proposition is like middleweight. It's, this is practice, but it's not earth-shattering. The span of the k-vectors is a subspace. So how do we proceed? <coughs> Got to check the three conditions. Namely, zero vectors a member of the proof. So the first thing you ask yourself is zero in this thing. And so that I'm not going to keep writing it over and over again. Let's call it V. Capital B, this, this thing. So you ask yourself, is zero in V? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Why? Because if you take the scalar zero, all, all, all the scalars. All the scalars. Choose all the C's to be zero, then C1, V1 plus C2, V2, so I'm being very pedantic here, is zero V1s plus zero V2s plus up to zero VKs, and we said that zero times any vector is zero, and zero vector plus zero vector is zero vector. So the standard, we're adding all of them, we're adding all of vectors. When you do a linear combination, it's, oh, okay. it's it, yeah. you have scalars for every single vector. Now, typically, if some of them are zero, you just don't bother writing those down in real life. Okay, two. What's next? Must be closed. Closed, uh, closed on scalar multiplication. Closed under scalar multiplication. Is V closed under scalar multiplication? So what do I have to do to decide that? Yeah, really do much of anything. So do you see anything? 
say for all so You still have to write out. Okay. Remember, I said yeah, yeah, yeah. these are not difficult arguments. Yeah. You still have to practice writing them. Okay. You make like T times C plus. Well, hang on. What do I have to start with? Choose a vector. A vector that's in the subspace. Right. Okay. So I would choose what you want to call the vector. QPI. No, don't do that. Just the X. X. Okay, or V is okay, but let's choose X and V. And and a scalar C and what you have to decide. If X times C is a number of V. Is CX likewise in V. Okay? So how do what does it mean to say X is in V? It means linear combination of V1 and V K. So there are scalars C1 to C K so that X is that linear combination, right? So you can say for some C1 to C K, X is this. And then the next obvious thing is, so I have my scalar C, I want CX, so CX is C times this mass. And what do you do? Distributed. Distributed. And then, then we these are all still scalars. These are all still <laughs> scalars. So you could say, if you want to be official or perhaps officious, you say, let di be c times ci. So i is now representing one of the indices between 1 and k. Right? I'm just going to name these guys d1 up to dk. This is a way of doing that without writing out a whole bunch of stuff. Okay? We have all of these are scalars, and Cx is a linear combination of the Vs with those scalars as coefficients. Got it? So this is belaboring details. But that's dotting every I. I didn't have any T's that aren't across those yet. OK? Everybody got it? Last but not least, under addition. So ask yourself, so, is V closed under addition? So what do I have to do now? I have to choose two vectors. I have to choose two vectors. <coughs> so choose x and y in v and ask yourself, is x plus y in v? So you write out what x is, you write out what y is, you write out what the sum is, and you say, well, of course. The sum is going to be c1. But we have to write it, OK? <laughs> so x looks like this. And this is like what we talked about yesterday when um, Russell asked me about it in the, in the case when we did two of them. Okay, what do I write for y? I use a different scale I got to use different scalars. So y is, what letter do you want to use? D. D's, all right. <coughs> So there's a bunch of steps here, right? And <laughs> officially, we should put in some of the steps. <clears throat> to be very honest, I'm not going to make you do very many arguments like this in the, in the course of this course, but you will have to do some. So make sure you know how to do them. So you want to write the sum. Plus the sum. And then you want to say, 
and rearranging, which is using commutative and associative properties officially. You put all the V1s together, you put all the V2s together, you put all the dot 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 VKs together, you see X plus OI is what? How many V how many V1s? C1 plus V1. C1 plus V1. How many V2s? C2 plus V2. And so on up to CK plus DK. And then what do you do to be official again? You do like E sub I equals right. C sub I plus E. So letting I won't use E for reasons you're going to see later today. What letter can I use? Um, <laughs> no, no, T sub I, so I'll have a T to cross. That doesn't look like so but in T sub I, you can see I plus DI, X plus Y, and of course these are scalars, is T1 V1 plus TK VK, so it's in the end group. Okay, that's it's almost painful writing all this stuff out. But I will encourage you to take the attitude that learning to do Mechanical proof writing is the first step to get into the point where you can do proof writing that isn't mechanical. It requires more genius. <laughs> you have to get good at the easy stuff and then have confidence to do the harder stuff. Okay, everyone okay with this? All right. So, I want to introduce some language here before we go on to the stuff. Dan was asking about. What do you suppose you took? This is why you want to use the letter V. E. Suppose you took a vector E1, which was 1 in the first slot and 0 everywhere else, and you took E2, which was 1 in the second slot and 0 everywhere else, up to En which is zeros everywhere except in the last slot. Any guess what their span should be? R N. So these are all in R N. I should make that clear. There's N of them, one for each slot in the vector. So does that have anything to do with like matrices when you have like one zero 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 zero? It does. <laughs> okay. Getting there tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> It'll be R to the N, right? Hmm? Would it be R to the N? Or R? Yeah. So what you guys are all conjecturing is that if you take all possible linear combinations of these, you should get all of Rn. Is that obvious? Yes. Yeah. If I take a vector in Rn, can you write it as a combination of these? Yeah. Sure. What scalars do you use? Whatever components you have for the vector. You exactly. Want. Sure. If, if x has coordinates or coefficients, whatever you want to call them, x1 to xn, <coughs> then note, and this will again we'll use this tomorrow as well, that x is x1 times the first vector, x2 times the second vector, up to xn times the nth vector. Agreed? Yeah. This isn't very exciting, but for reasons that you will discover in a few months, E1 to En, <coughs> these vectors that are sort of standard things with zeros and ones, are called the standard basis vectors for Rn. Now, you don't know what the word basis means, but you shall. But basically, it's just a way of saying that they're standard because you built them out of just the standard coordinate system. And basis vectors is saying what we said here, that you can write any vector uniquely as a combination of them. And we'll study that word 
what it means later in the course. Okay. So, um, comment for the future. Suppose you had X. Might even be a comment for the present, now that I think about it. Suppose you had a, a vector x that somebody was thinking of, but that person did not divulge the coordinates of x to you. This happens in physics, actually, quite a bit, where you have some vector that has physical meaning, but you aren't given it in terms of numbers for coordinates. How would you recover the coordinates of x? How could you figure out x1 to xn using these guys. So you have no numbers at vector at all. I have no numbers, but you're going to figure out what the numbers are by doing what algebraic thing? With, with these standardized vectors. If you take x and you dot it with E1, what does that give you? The first component of this Oh, I Do you see it? Yeah. Right? What's the formula for dot product? You take this vector and this vector, you line them up, and you multiply corresponding things and add. So what do you get? You get x1 times 1 plus x2 times 0 plus x3 times 0 and so on. What do you get? x1. So by projecting your vector on the standard basis vectors, you figure out what the coordinates of your vector are. You project this guy on, for example, the third axis here. If you dot with E3, you get exactly that component. So you're assuming that you know the dot products of x and E1s and stuff, but you don't know what the numbers are? Well, you're discovering the numbers by doing that. Right. How would you calculate the dot product? Well, the first place? I mean, you're laughing at me for this, and you're going to have a much better laugh when we get to chapter three and I do my standard figuring out gas mileage trick. But you might, for example, know this angle. Okay. 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 And you might, for example, know the length of X. Okay. Okay. Uh, at least that's now you're not laughing as hard. Yeah. It's just like much. If you don't know the length of X. I mean, do you see the point? Yeah. yeah. That you might be able to do this geometrically uh -huh. even without having had coordinates for x. Okay? So it wasn't a completely stupid remark. Just more <laughs> stupid. <laughs> All right. So, coming back to what Dan was asking about. Given a subspace V define V perp. So this is red, V perp. I suppose I suppose it's the perp that the cops are looking for or something. <laughs> so what the perp is shorthand for perpendicular. If we, you know, if we were being consistent, we would call it V orth, <laughs> but no one does. No. Everyone calls it V perp. What do you think V perp should be? It should be all the vectors that are perpendicular to V. Perpendicular to v. So it's the set of all. So again, we're in R n somewhere, and I'm going to, I'm about to do a bunch of numerical things with numbers. So hang in a few more seconds. X in R n such that X dot V is zero, but here's the crucial thing you have to include in your definition. It has to be orthogonal to every vector in B. So for example, suppose I took the x1, x2 plane to be V, and I'm sitting in R3 here. What do you think V perp should be? Everything in the Say again? So everything that has only a third component. 
Okay, namely? Every scalar multiple of E3. Right. So do you all agree with Matthias that that, that, that feels like what should be E perp? Only vectors in the third direction are going to be orthogonal to everybody in this plane. You can imagine spinning around a wheel here, and you have to be orthogonal to all of these guys on that pinwheel. So that leads you only the axle of the pit pinwheel. Okay? Now suppose we were in R4. So my picture skills are lacking at this point. <laughs> So, schematically, you could think of R4 as having an R2 here and an R2 here. Or, you could think of R4 as having an R2 that's in the x1, x2 direction. And, and schematically, you could take an orthogonal R2 And notice I'm drawing this so they're intersecting only at the origin. No, that's a wing. <laughs> <laughs> so it, here's the x1, x2 plane, and there's the x3, x4 plane. Uh, but they don't intersect except for. So this, this is x1, x2 here. And this is. This also has other more unfortunate <laughs> associations for people far older than you. Which is not my illusion or, re or preference to make any reference to it at all. But <laughs> anyway, what do you think the perk of the x1, x2 plane should be? It'd be a in R4 plane. The other ones. Yeah. So long. It's like that one. No, it's that one. So we're in R4. It's actually R4. It's your red plane. There's a whole plane that's perpendicular. It's a whole plane now. Right? All the vectors that are orthogonal to everybody that has coordinates here. Right? The x1, x2 plane looks like this. What vector is going to be ortho? Where star means it can be any real number. Okay. What vector is going to be orthogonal to all of those? Intuitively, anyway. Zero, 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 zero star, star. Anything in those slots. Okay. So that's going to put you in this part of the space. So in this picture, analogously, if I had, this is again purely schematic, and when my 4D blackboard comes in from back order, I'll be able to do better. <laughs> this is the R2 that we're talking about, and the orthogonal R2 is the red one. Five-dimensional chalk, right? Right. Oh Six, actually. Does it have more colors that we can't see? <laughs> of course. Okay. So, V per here should be all vectors that have zeros there and whatever is there. All right, so I'm going to do some very concrete numerical examples for you in a second, but what do you think I want to state is true about V perp? It's the number of dimensions. Not, uh, we aren't using that word for anything okay. official. Is it N No, no, no. That's not what I want to say. It's a subspace. It's a subspace. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. The word dimension shall be coming up in later chapters. <laughs> so the, the proposition here is V perp is again a subspace. And at this point, you're getting sick of this, so let's make it a little more expedient. Maybe we can fit it in this much room. Oh, man. Oh. Hmm. Is zero in there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Zero is perpendicular to all of Zero is perpendicular to everybody. And So in that particular, is perpendicular to everybody in V. So one, zero dot V is zero for all V and V. Check. Two, <coughs> scalars. If X is in V perp, 
what is true about CX, just, how do we check that? Just gonna look at it. <laughs> <laughs> you have like, they don't have any components in the other planes. Well, but you don't need that, you can just go ahead and X, X is by definition perpendicular to all V and V. Uh, and? And so if you do C, X dot V, it's still the same thing. It's C times, times X. Zero. Yeah, it's C times X dot V, which, yeah. There you go. which yeah. So the relevant algebra is dotting C, X with V is the same as C times the dot product of X with V, which is zero. So C, X is perpendicular to everybody in V. All V. Okay, last one. If x and y are both in v perp, is x plus y? Yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, there is a reason I'm doing all this stuff and boring you with it, because it's going to come up as important things in the rest of the week. Nice. X dot v plus so what property of dot product do we use? Distributive. Distributive. This is x dot v plus y dot v, which is zero plus zero, which is still zero. Yay. Today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I promised you numbers. Let's have some numbers. We have like three, seven, and nine. All the numbers I need today. If you really want three, seven, and nine, we can do those. I was I was planning to use some more convenient numbers. Such as zero and two. Zero. Close. Zero. 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 <laughs> and let's ask ourselves, selves, selves. 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 what is the span of the vector 1, negative 1, 1? What does that look like to you? A line. A line. And <laughs> under, under some duress, we can even sketch what the line looks like. <laughs> right? Again, I don't insist on drawing things to scale, but we could sort of get one unit, one unit this way, one unit up, and get some vector that looks like that. And so what's the span going to look like? All scalar multiples, so it's that line. All right, so you, you can probably guess what I'm going to ask. There we go. No, we know it's What is the perp of this? Negative one one. Negative one. It's a, no, no, it's the plane. It's the whole plane. plane is perpendicular. Or that it is. So the, the perp of this. <laughs> the higher plane is also in some space. Yeah, you're going to do It's all of our own. Every collision. Wait, what? Isn't it any plane that that line is in? No. No, because no. if the line is in the plane, for example, if I took the line in this plane, yeah. it's not orthogonal to. Vectors along itself. Yeah. Right, but it's orthogonal to every other vector. No. Mm. It's orthogonal to the plane. No. If I take a plane and I take this vector, it's orthogonal only to those guys in the plane. It's not orthogonal to the other vectors in that plane. Right. Oh, yeah. I don't know what else is going on. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> so this is the set of vectors in R3. That are orthogonal to every vector in this span. So, what determines being orthogonal to every vector in this span? Every vector. Just being orthogonal to that single vector is good enough. Because right. all the other vectors are scalar multiples of it. So, what do we have here? We have a linear equation. And this course, after all, is going to be to some extent about understanding solutions of systems of linear equations. Right? This, this is the set of x's in R3 that satisfy the equation x1 minus x2 plus x3 is 0. So this is, I'm, I'm going to mention even now, one of the major themes of the whole year course. This is describing a plane, you guys are all telling me, namely a plane that looks something like this, maybe. 
goes on forever. This is giving an equation for the plane. So this is what you might call an implicit representation of the plane. Anything, anything you have an equation for, you, you're giving it implicitly. Like if I take a circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, you're not giving y explicitly as a function of x, but you're giving it implicitly. Remember implicit differentiation from? Yeah. And yeah, well, we're getting back there. Yeah. <laughs> it's implicit because you have an equation, but you don't have one of the variables explicitly in terms of the other. What would be a more geometric way of understanding this plane? How were we talking about planes yesterday? Hmm? Linear combination. Yeah, can you give me how many vectors do you think I need to determine what the plane is? Two non parallel vectors, right? Can you find me two non parallel vectors in that plane? that span the plane. That would be a much more geometric way to get your hands on the plane. Here's this vector, here's this other vector, I see the plane. I see this equation, all I really see is the normal vector to the plane. Which is good enough, but there's two different ways of looking at stuff. So can you find me two vectors that you think span this plane? So I go to the post office and I put up a wanted sign vectors of the plane. One, two non-parallel vectors spanning, yeah, spanning <coughs> our plane. Yes? Um, zero, negative one, negative one, and one, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to take a little editorial license. Matthias, we're negatives here, but I don't want to bother. Oh, so many negatives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Zero, one, one. Is that perpendicular to one, negative, one, one? Uh-huh. Yes. One, one, zero. would work, but that wasn't what Matthias wanted. He wanted zero, one, one, and one, two, one. <laughs> I mean, you guys can offend him and not take his if you want. Um, how would we actually prove? So we can do either one. I'll, I'll, I'll do this one just because it's a little easier, but then I'll do, argue with Tia's example afterwards. How would we prove? following claims. So mathematicians like to make claims. <coughs> you think they were out mining for ore or something, but they're not. <laughs> the perp of money for me. <laughs> the span of one negative one one is the span of the two vectors one one zero and zero, one, one. Yep. How would you, so this is something you're going to get more used to doing in homework as well. How would you prove two sets are equal? How prove that they're going to bang each other. <laughs> <laughs> or a subset of each other. Okay. So if you have a set and another set, recall that it means to say x is a subset of y means that you have a Venn diagram that looks something like this. So to say x is a subset of y is to say that if x is an element of x, then what must be true? X is an element of y. It must be along to y as well. And to show two sets are equal, the easiest way often to do it is to show that each is a subset of the other. Okay with that? Yeah. All right. So, which way 
which one do you want to start with? If this is our x and this is our y, which one do you want to start with? Uh, x, x is a subset of y. X is a subset of y. I'll give you a hint. You want to start That's the one. harder one. You want to start with the big one and do the two fractions. So just to make your life easier, not because I'm trying to spoil your fun, but let's start with y contained in x. If you take some combination of these two vectors, why is it in the perf of this vector? Because the linear combination, like, it, so if you have, say, the vector in x, like the span of x is just, say, it's x or whatever. Right, and then the other one is y. So the this, this span. The no, 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 well, okay, what do I have to check to see that this vector is in the perp of this? Oh, you have the dot product. Yeah. 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 Do you guys see that? Yeah. All I have to do is check that that vector x satisfies this equation. <coughs> right, that, if I dot with this vector, and I get 0, that means x is orthogonal to this vector, hence any scalar multiple of it. So it's orthogonal to everybody in the line. How do I see that this is 0? That's presumably how we made up these vectors, right? Yeah. Was so that their dot products would be 0 with this guy. Does anyone recognize? Say a homework problem that's due tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan, I didn't hear you. Oh, I said no. I know, I didn't hear you. What? Has anyone done the last the problem last on the homework? Yeah. yeah. If these vectors are orthogonal to that vector, then any linear combination of them is orthogonal to this vector. Uh, oh, yeah, I did that. Oh. It's the same proof we've done, right? All right? So this is C1 times this dot product plus C2 times this dot product. And those were made up. Unless you goofed, you made up these two vectors exactly so these would be zero. <laughs> I don't think you could. I think it's okay. All right. Now let's do the other direction. Y is exactly. Why is Y O Y is X a subset of Y? Because if you put in a scalable argument. <laughs> Negative one, negative one, one, and then like put it into that equation over there. It equals zero every time. No, that's not doing it. Why not? You've got to show me that any vector that satisfies this equation can be written in this fashion. No. You must show okay. under penalty of low grade or something worse. You must show that any vector that is perpendicular to 1, negative 1, 1, so I'm going to choose to write it in terms of this equation, can be written as a linear combo of the two vectors. Right after satisfying? Okay. So any vector x satisfying this equation can be written as something times this plus something times this. Oh, well you know that uh, Does it have something to do with the ease? It could. It doesn't have to. It, really, I want you to think about this equation. <laughs> Let's write out oh. x, 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 x,
<laughs> yeah, you're on the right track. So would it? Uh, Never mind. Let's write out the x we have on that on hundred for that. Let's distribute the c's and like write it out as vector. Well, like c one, c one plus c. Ah, okay. Okay, okay very cool. So Matthew wants me to take sort of work backwards. He's saying any linear combination would be of the form c1. What's the second coordinate? C1 plus c2. And c2. All right, but be careful not to go. All right, now what? Now we can plug that into the equation. Why not? Now all you're doing is checking that this satisfies that, which we already knew. Okay. But you're very close. You know that. You're trying to tell me, given x, oh God. what are the c1 and c2 that will give me x when I take c1 of these plus c2 of these? So, like c1 equals so you, you know x is that coordinates x1, x2, x3. So like set each of those equal to the Well, better, you're, you're very close. So set C1 equal to X1, and what should C2 be? X3. 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 And then you have to prove that the last one. Then let's just ask, what's C1 times 110 plus C2 times 011? Well, it's X1 times 110 plus x3 times 0, 1, 1. And let's ask, is this x? So is this oh, equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3? So what, what do you get when you put this like stuff together? How many in the first slot? X1. x1. Let me put it here where you can see it. x1. And you can't see it. x1 plus x3. And then x3. Is that x? Yeah. It's x because x satisfies this equation, which tells you, as Matthew said earlier, x2 equals x1 plus x3. So this is x. Bingo. I'm going to do it a different way for those of you who aren't as tricky as these guys were. Go ahead. Um, so doesn't, so x1 plus x3 equals x2, right? Mm -hmm. Do we not want the second row of that last bracket you wrote to be negative x2? We want it to be positive. No, you know, you, because the negative Solve for x2 here. The right. components. Right, so, it's, so, it's, so if you rewrote that last thing, it would be x1, x2, and x3. Not right, x1 which is what you wanted. You wanted, you wanted x to be... X is actually positive x2. The equation... Oh, the equation is negative, but that's... Right, so the x, x is x1, x2, x3. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. That's okay. All right, so for those of you, I'm, I'm going to do this for the, just like one minute and then we're done. For those of you who don't think that was something you would have thought to do, although I think it was very clever, let's just take this equation. This is going to be an algorithm that you will be a master of when we get to chapter four. I know. Just take the equation and Alternative solution would be to say if x1 minus x2 plus x3 is 0, then we can, I'm going to solve for x1 just instead of x2, but it's the same idea. x1 is what? x2 minus x3. So any x satisfying this can be written in the form, oh, okay. <laughs> this is really very equivalent, x2 not two as clever. X2, x2 minus x3, x2, and x3. Now, what can you think to do with this? You can split it up into two. You can vectors. split it up. It's a certain number of x2s in each slot, plus a certain number of x3s in each slot. Fill in the vectors for me. 1, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 1. So close and yet so far. 
what can I do with this vector if I want it? So 1, 1, 0 is good. Yeah, he does. But what, can you figure out algebraically how to write this vector in terms of these two vectors? It's zero one one minus one one zero. The second one minus the first one, right? It's zero one one minus one one zero. One one zero. Everybody agree? Yes. Yes. But now you can redistribute. How many? How many of these do I have all together? I have x2 of them, minus x3, minus x3 of them. Plus x3. x3 times the second. So this is an alternative way of doing the problem. It's a little bit more just follow the rules, but, it, but what you guys did before is... Notice it's not the same formula, because here I'm using x2 and x3 as my variables. And there I was using x1 and x3. But both are correct. Okay. 